Well, good morning and welcome one more time to Encounter Church. My name is uh, Dirk, pastor here at Encounter, and we're so glad that you're here with us today. Uh, just before we jump into the series, Jesus in His Own Words, I want to give a couple of special announcements that are coming up. By popular demand, we are going to be bumping back our, our Sunday morning worship times by a half an hour. So it's a, a lot of people have kind of fed into this. Hey, we would love like an extra half an hour to get ready, maybe sleep in a little bit. So we're bumping it back a half an hour, so 9.30 and 11 o'clock, starting the Sunday after Easter. That's April 23, 9.30 and 11. I talked to someone uh, earlier this week who said, this is perfect because uh, if I forget, I'm just going to be early for church. So if that's you, if you're choosing not to like remember this, you're in good shape. Uh, 9.30 and 11, Sunday after Easter. The other one is, speaking of Easter, this is a perfect time to invite your friends and neighbors and family members to come try church. And, and maybe make this a rhythm that they honor for a long, long time. Uh, we we want to help you with that. So on the survey that we did like a month ago or so, um, it was interesting to note that when we asked the question from like hundreds of you all uh, gave us responses, and it was the question was, uh, how have you heard about Encounter? And there's lots of options, but you could choose only one. Over half of you chose the one that said, someone invited me which you're going to continue to hear a lot about because it continues to be the case that the most effective and the most important way that you can invite somebody to church is by like a physical face-to-face or maybe like, you know, social invite to that person. Not Facebook, not uh, like the website or even driving by inviting. So you're going to see like postcards and a campaign to like build up to invite people to come try church, try worship starting on Easter. Okay, Uh, and at Easter... We are going to be talking about Jesus, which is awesome, in his own words. You see what I did there? Awesome transition into the series. The re- it was, I thought it was funny. All right. Um, they laughed at nine. So. Uh, the series, Jesus in his own words, the reason why I think that this is a hugely important series for, for us to capture here, for, for us to address, is because we all have opinions about Jesus. We, we all have an idea about who Jesus was or who Jesus is. We just can't help it. There's, there's people maybe that you think that, um, that Jesus was a, a myth, or Jesus was a great teacher, or Jesus was a prophet, or, or Jesus was God. Uh, but, but for whatever reason, we all have an opinion about who Jesus was and who Jesus is. Uh, just by way of example, a little while back, I had the opportunity to go on a trip. Uh, it was a long plane flight, and when you sit next to somebody, especially when you're traveling by yourself... Um, there's a, there's a conversation that starts up, and many of you are never going to know the severe awkwardness that it is to tell somebody next to you on a plane flight that you are a Christian minister. And they hate that, and they're like, you know, the color just drains from their face, and they're like, oh man. It, so this happened, you know, we sit next, next to each other, and every, when you're in my shoes, every plane flight conversation follows a four-step pattern. It's like every time. It's crazy how this works. Step number one is I ask you a question like, hey, where are you going? And I'm looking around going, literally everybody is traveling to Chicago right now. (laughs) And if, if that answer is not, you know, too snarky, then you'll get to step two in the conversation, which is, what do you do for a living? And this is when I say, um, I'm, actually, I'm actually a pastor. And then you can see like the color drain out of their face, and then it leads into step three, which is inevitably apologizing for the language that they used previously in the conversation. <laughs> and then it goes into awkward stage four, which is my personal favorite, because in stage four of the, of the conversation, people start to recall all of, the, like, all of the religious experiences or places that they've got, the Christian things in their life. They just start like sharing it all with me. In third, like it's confession time. In third grade, I went to a vacation Bible school. Like, okay, I got married, and I was at, not in a church, but I think there was a church nearby. I'm pretty sure of it. Right? They just start sharing all this. And most of the time, they end up sharing with me what their opinion is about who Jesus is. So I was sitting next to a guy some, this one time, and we, we ended up making it through all four stages. And so he starts sharing with me his you know, religious opinions and ideas and all this other stuff, which is awesome. I love that, by the way. But So he shares with me, not a Christian, strongly opposed to Christianity, but, but really loves, uh, loves Jesus. And so he starts sharing with me, again, not a Christian, but, but how important Jesus is in his life. Because as he kind of recalls, he goes, Jesus is this incredible moral teacher, right? He changed the world. I mean, it's, it's just unbiased, kind of objectively. He is probably the most influential person that has ever lived. 
I mean, this guy, again, not a Christian, but he's talking to me. He goes, Jesus spent a long time talking about his kingdom. Now, he kind of interpreted the kingdom as like moral code. I think it's a lot more than that, but, but whatever. He goes, the kingdom, this kingdom that Jesus was talking about, we're still talking about it today, which means, which, again, not a Christian, but which means that the kingdom that Jesus came to start outlasted all of the kingdoms that has ever existed. Like, how wild is that, right? He's got an opinion about who Jesus is. Now, you could counter that with, like, Jesus also claimed to be God, so it's hard to, like, make a claim like that and then still, like, live on the fence of moral teacher. I mean, you're either not, like a lunatic, you're either lying, or you're actually Lord, right? But it doesn't matter because everybody has an opinion about who Jesus is. I think we've got a lot of opinions in the room about who Jesus is, right? I mean, some of you came here today with an understanding, I think I know who Jesus is. I maybe grew up with Jesus. I made a, I made a commitment. Maybe it was at that third grade vacation Bible study school, but, but I made a commitment to follow Jesus and to live my life after him. And, you know, I tried to do everything that I could from that day forward, and I will try to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Except for w- within that, though, there, there's that idea, that concept that, that, that may, maybe your opinion of Jesus is one that never quite disagrees with you, which may be a problem. Uh, Tim Keller said one time that, that if your idea of God, if God never disagrees with you, maybe it isn't God that you're worshiping, but an idealized version of yourself. We all have opinions about who Jesus is. And it's a dangerous thing to live in the place of Jesus never, never disagreeing with me, because maybe that's me I'm I'm worshiping and not Jesus, not God. For some of you, maybe your idea about Jesus is someone who's promised the world. Like he promised all of these great things would come into your place. The job thing would come and the marriage thing would come into place. Relationships, family, everything would come into place. And you're just praying and you're waiting for Jesus to shower down all of these things. And it sounds a little bit more like Santa Claus than it does the Jesus of the Bible. But still, we all have opinions about who Jesus is. Maybe some of you came here today needing Jesus to show up because you want to know, you want to know that he's actually and really out there. And so this is like last chance time for Jesus to show up and make a difference in your life and reveal himself finally after all of these years. And if that's you and if you're in that spot, I hope and I pray that Jesus does show up for you today and this week. But the point of all of this is to say that we all have opinions about who Jesus is is. And the good news is that Jesus also, he wanted us to know who he is so badly that he didn't hide himself from us. He didn't run around in in, in cloaks and shadows to keep keep us from finding out who he is. Jesus badly wanted us to know him fully. He wanted us to know him so much that he talked about himself all the time. He, He shared with us just who he is, what he's capable of, and what he came to do. Jesus came into this world, into the the Gospel of John, the Jesus story, according to John. He gave these seven statements, these I am statements. And when Jesus, of all the opinions that we have of him, when Jesus turns and talks about himself and who he is and what he came to do, we should pay attention. So for this series, leading up to Easter, we're not going to talk about what our opinions are about Jesus or what you heard, or who you think Jesus might be. We're going to hear from Jesus who Jesus is. Let's go to the gospel, the Jesus story, according to John. Page numbers are on the program, uh, the Bibles and the chairs in front of you. If you don't have a Bible at home, just go ahead and take it. We give away those all the time, and we love that. The words, though, are going to be on the screen behind me. We're going to go to John chapter 8. And before we do, I want to say that there's four gospels, Jesus stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Three of them are called synoptic gospels. That means that they they kind of all work, they follow the same pattern. They're arranged uh, pretty quickly chronologically, like, and then this happened, and then this happened. The way that John writes his Jesus story is, like, he's less focused on the, the chronology of Jesus' story and, and focuses more on some of, the big, some of the big themes 
about who Jesus is. So it really sets the Gospel of John apart. It reads totally different, super confusing in places, but that's okay. There's a lot of depth there too. One of the ways that John has arranged his Gospel is around these seven statements, these seven I am statements. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection of the life. And we're going to see another one here in the, in the text, in this story this morning. So let's tune in. Let's listen to, to Jesus talk about himself. It says in John 8, verse 12, it says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, he said I am the light of the world. Okay, we're going to skip around in the Bible a little bit from here because Jesus, this is like a throwback Bible study. So I hope that's cool. Like you have a choice anyway. But we're going to like skip around because, because Jesus is picking up on these themes that are like all throughout the Bible and he's like adapting them and he's relating them. He's saying, yes, yes, I am the fulfillment of all of these. So for example, this statement when he says, I am the light of the world. What Jesus is picking up on, and he, he writes this and John writes this in the most clumsy, awkward, and redundant way possible. In fact, you would think from a first read that, that John maybe made a typo or a mistake because, because this grammatically it doesn't really make much sense, except for the fact that John wrote it this way, and exactly this way, seven times in his gospel. I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. And here he says, I am the light of the world. So we know this is not a mistake. John is trying to tell us something. In this case, the word it reads in English, we just see it's I am. But when John was writing it in Greek, it, it goes something like, like I, I am the light of the world. You see, you get like, that doesn't really make sense. So we just kind of like simplify it and smush it together in order for it to make sense. However, what Jesus was picking up on doesn't make any sense to us in the world. But to his listeners in that room that day, it was deeply offensive. Because what Jesus was, was referring to is this Old Testament way of referring back to God and how God related the people by saying, I, I am the light of the world. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. When Moses, some of you remember Moses, maybe from that vacation Bible school that you went to in third grade, Moses was the one that led the Israelites out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, into the desert, and then eventually into the promised land, but that's another story for another day. When when God finds Moses, is in the form of the burning bush, that story, Moses comes by, and he sees this bush that's like burning and burning and, and doesn't burn out, and so like he finds God, and in God's presence, his voice is like within that burning bush experience. It's this crazy story, and God gives Moses this task. He says, Moses, you're going to lead my people out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, into the place that I'm going to show them. Now, Moses at the time is like, you know, hanging out at the tender age of 80 years old. And so he's got to die to his own dream of moving to Florida and taking up golf. But that's a different story. Moses is now engaged here with this conversation with God. He's like, this, this is a pretty big task to go to Pharaoh in Egypt, like that Pharaoh, yeah, and to ask, you know, to let these hundreds of thousands of people just kind of leap his labor force. So Moses thinks for a second, and he asks the question, who should I say sent me? And God gives this response in Exodus 3, verse 14. God said to Moses, he goes, I am who I am. And this is what you say to the Israelites, I am has sent you. Okay, um, the way that God refers to himself, to Moses, and this comes up a number of times in the Bible, he says, when you need to know, like, who I, who, who this one, me, just, just simply call it, just simply say, I, the I am has sent me. Now, it's all through, I, the, I, the great I am has sent me. We pick it up again in the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, where we see standing before God, he's called the great I am. The, the idea here is that before creation that was ever spoken into the nothing, the I am existed. Now, the world is operating and turning on its axis, and the I am continues it so. After all of this has been done away with, and the curtains are drawn, and the play is over, the I am will continue to exist. That's the significance of that, of, of the I am behind it. But, but now Jesus, Jesus picks up these words when everybody is wondering. He's doing these miracles and wondering, Jesus, like, who are you and where'd you come from anyway? And Jesus turns to the crowd, to the Israelites, to everybody listening in, including us today, and he says, I, I am 
the light of the world. You can understand, can't you, why they hated him so. You can understand what was so incredibly frustrating about this. You can understand why eventually on Good Friday they would have him executed via crucifixion. You could understand what got them so worked up that they simply wanted him dead. Who makes a statement like that? And here Jesus is saying, once of seven times, I, I am. And this time he goes on and he says, I, I am the light of the world. The light of the world. Now listen, guys, we, we have to, when Jesus is saying this, there's a couple of important things that are going on. The, the most important one is that, is that the festival of tabernacles is, is taking place while he's saying this. We're going to dive down deep. It's going to get weird, and then it's going to get pretty awesome on the other side. So hang with me if you could. If you just need to tune out for this part, I'll try to rope you back in later. But, but stick with me if you could. The Feast of the Tabernacles, sometimes called the Feast of Booths, is one of three major Jewish holidays that the whole calendar kind of turned on. It's like our Christmas and Easter. You know, it's like the big movements of the, of the year. Um, the, the Feast of Tabernacles specifically... It, is there's a celebration where everybody sort of moves out of their homes into the open air and they set up camp. Like literally, they camp in tents. The reason why they do that is because that moment, the exodus that we talked about earlier, bringing the people out, that was so incredibly formative and important to them that they never wanted to forget what God had done for them. So uh, they moved out of Egypt and they moved into the desert for a while, 40 years, and then they went into the promised land. And it was such an important part of their history, their story, that they said every year we are going to move out of our homes during this Feast of Tabernacles and we're going to live in tents just like our ancestors had lived in tents, just like God himself lived in a tent called the tabernacle. When they go out, they set up the tabernacle, God's house, the temple precursor, without bricks, but it's like, you know, tent form, and then they all set up their tents, and then when it was time to move, they like pack it all up and try to stuff it back in the case that's inevitably too small because some things never change, and then they, and then they like move out, right? And they keep going for a while. That was the, that was the, feast, the temp, uh, feast of Tabernacles. The reason I think why they did that was the same reason that most of us go camping. <laughs> because you don't truly appreciate indoor plumbing until you live without it for a week. Just like then, like you don't appreciate totally what God has done for you in leading them to this place until they live without it for a short season. And they do this every year. Now, why that's important to when Jesus is speaking these words about being the light of the world is that part of that festival, uh, part of the tradition was that while they were walking around in the desert in that place and wandering around, God had not left them. And they remember that too. God was leading them. And he was leading them by a pillar of fire at night. And he was leading them by a pillar of, of smoke or maybe a cloud by day. God's presence was like going before them wherever they went. So they would celebrate that too. At the temple, it's on a small hill, and there was a big temple structure, so it like towered over everything else. So the temple, they had four corners. They would gather in the temple courtyard, all the people, and then, and then they'd have a couple of the priests climb up. There's four pillars and they'd climb up with these huge vats of olive oil, sort of like the, the, the lamp oil of the day. And they'd climb up these massive ladders to the very tops of the pillars. They'd pour the oil in. They would use the, they would use the garments of the priests as wicks for the torches, because, like, why not? And, and they'd, they'd light them up at night. And it was so important because it reminded them about God leading them through the desert, through the wilderness, so, so many years ago the pillar of fire. And it was said that wherever you lived in Jerusalem, during the feast, the, the, the feast of the Tabernacles, when they lit up those torches, wherever you were in Jerusalem, you could look and you could see the flames burning at night. And when they extinguished them in the morning, you could see the columns of smoke or clouds rising up from those four corners of the pillar, reminding them God has not left them. God is still leading them. God is still guiding them. God is still protecting them. And then Jesus, when he is asked, who are you? And what did you come here to do? He turns to the crowds, friends, and he says, I, I am the light of the world. 
And I just imagine that right behind him, there was, there was four pillars of fire lighting up the night sky. Or if it was day, there was four pillars of smoke that you could see anywhere in Jerusalem. And he said, all of those stories, they point to me. Everything you grew up with, knowing about God, learning about God, you are learning and growing up with me. Jesus turns to everybody and he says, I will never leave you. I will never break my promises on you. I will always guide you. I will always protect you. I was over your ancestors in the past and I am for you today. I, I am the light of the world. It's a huge, huge statement that he's making. And he goes on, he builds on it. And he says, not only I, I am the, the light of the entire world, wherever you will be, you will be able to look on me. You will be able to see me. He builds on that and he says, and by the way, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. One of the things, I say this like every other week, but it continues to be true, but one of the things I love about about studying like the Bible um, and like getting into some of these things is that the more you dig, the more you uncover. It's wild. Uh, in fact, the rabbis in Jesus' day said that um, studying God's word is the, most, uh, is the most important act of worship, they said. That even like with prayer, you, you talk to God. And they said, that's great. But, but like reading the word, like you hear from God, which is pretty awesome, like encouragement to like read the Bible, maybe take one of these home with you if you want. But, but that's, by the way, totally beside the point. What I'm saying... <laughs> When he follows, uh, when he says, whoever follows me, this is not so much like, yes, and I'm lighting the path that goes in the road. I am guide. I'm leading you. A couple things that I want us to see about the light when Jesus talks about himself. He goes, number one, the light reveals God. We heard about that in the smoke and the pillar and Jesus saying, by the way, I am the light of the world. I am revealing God. The second one is I am guiding you. The light reveals God and it guides us. I was reminded of a story earlier this week. A friend of mine was telling me a story where he was outside of the States. He was in a developing country. The roads transportation network was pretty sketchy at best. And he was out in the countryside. He goes, listen, you have to understand, there is no light. It is completely dark out there. There are stars, and that is it. And we're driving through here, and it's rough, and it's dangerous. And you thought, Michigan roads are bad. You haven't seen anything like this. Although no winter. But anyway... He's driving through, and he goes, the weirdest thing happened. I were driving through, and, uh, and this car, like, pulls up behind us. And, and it, was, it was riding pretty close, and it, he, didn't, he didn't turn on his lights. And it's the strangest thing, because it's dangerous out here, right? And it was kind of winding through these, these backcountry roads, right, away from everything. But, but at, the longer they went on, the car never turns on his lights. In fact, he got closer and closer uh, to the car that, that my friend here was in, was driving. And they thought, this is after 10, 20 minutes of this, it's just, this is so strange and a little scary. And so they kind of like snake their way, wind their way through, and the car's like bumper to bumper, like right behind them, until they get to the next town. They get to the next town, and that car like, like pulls up and, and parks like right next to them. He puts down his window, and he says, I have to thank you. I have to thank you because I was out there, and my headlights weren't working. And if... If it weren't for me following your taillights, there's no way that I can make it home safely. And friends, when I read this passage, that image is just seared into my mind, and I hope it will be for yours as well this week. That we think about following closely after, behind Jesus, the light of the world, not walking or driving in the darkness, but, but seeing and following after him. And if we have any shot of making it to our heavenly home, safely. It's with following closely the taillights that Jesus drives in front of us. Now, light reveals God. Light guides us as we hear. And by the way, there's, a, there's an awesome facet of the story. I wasn't sure if I was going to say this, but we're just going to say it anyway. Um, there's an awesome facet of these stories that uh, and I didn't know this until earlier this week, to be honest with you, but uh, I didn't know the seven, there's seven I am statements of John, the good shepherd, the resurrection, the bread of life, the light of the world, all of these things. And I didn't know all of them, all of them are accompanied by a miracle of some sort or another. 
right? So, so Jesus is like, hey, and by the way, this is like filling out the rest of who I am. So when, when, Jesus, um, when Jesus is just about to say, I am the bread of life, you know, when just before he said that, he took a kid's lunch bucket with a couple of loaves of bread and some fish, multiplied it and fed 5,000 people. And then he gathers everybody around and he says, oh, and by the way, I, I am the bread of life. Right? But before, but right before he, he raises his friend Lazarus from the dead, he goes and visits and he sees Lazarus' sister and she's weeping and she's crying because her, her brother Lazarus had just died days before and they just finished putting him in the tomb, in the ground. And Jesus comes up and says, why are you crying? And she says, Lord, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus looks at her and says right to her face, he says, I am, I, I am the resurrection in the life. And then he calls out to his friend, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus does. Like, talk about an object lesson, right? It's the sort of thing that, like, the gospel is built around. And here, when Jesus says, I I am the light of the world, in the very next chapter, he's just about to meet a man where light has never come into his eyes or his brain in his life. He was born blind, Bartimaeus. And he looks at Bartimaeus and he heals him. He restores sight and the light has come into his eyes and I would argue his heart for the first time in his life. Talk about an object lesson. Light. Light reveals God. Light guides us and Barnabas follows him wherever he goes. But light also exposes. You see, and, and, and then that's the one. That's the one that Jesus also came for that we don't like to think about. And they didn't like to think about and some things never change. They didn't like to think about light exposes because that's great when you're on the Guatemala countryside and there is no light around and you can't see your way to make it safely home and the light guides the way. That is an entirely different thing when light exposes the dark corridors of our hearts. I'll, I'll give you this example that I so much shared. And maybe it's not a good one. You be the judge. But, but someone's like, like, hey, light exposes. You know, it's like, a, it's like in the days of your youth, when, or, you know, maybe, it doesn't matter. Um, that when you, like, went out at night and you went to these places where, like, the music is pumping, right, and everybody's out dancing and it's dark and it's loud and it's, like, a good time. Everybody's digging it and loving it. And then, like, 2 a.m. rolls around and then 3 a.m. rolls around and they give out the last call and they say this is the last song. And then afterwards, you know, the club, music is bumping, lights are down. And then all of a sudden the music tapers and fades out and the house lights come on and you look around and what was once, like fun and awesome and engaging is now like kind of gross and sweaty and dirty and sort of sticky at the same time. And you're like looking around going, I think I'm the only one here celebrating 80s night. Ironically, nobody else is. You know, maybe that was in the days in the past. Maybe that was last night for you. If no judgment, we're glad that you're here. More likely you're watching online, so still glad for that. No judgment. (laughs) Right? Light, though. Light exposes. And sometimes it's not comfortable. Sometimes it's not what we want to see. But sometimes it's what we need to see. Light, ex- Jesus exposes those dark corridors of our heart that honestly sometimes we don't want to go in. We don't want to see what's in there. We don't want to know what's behind those doors that we locked. Jesus is going to call you out on something. That's the way he does You see, I love Jesus so much. We talk about him. We celebrate. We sing worship to him as God every weekend because he makes an incredible difference and is changing this world for the good. But the way that he does that isn't always comfortable. We're drawn into Jesus like moths to a light because he's telling us about mercy, about grace, and about love. And he is doing all of these things. But sometimes the most gracious things, the most merciful things, the most loving things that he can possibly say are not easy to hear. And so as we're drawn into Jesus and he reveals the heart of God and he guides us along and he also also flips on the lights and exposes all of the junk that's there. And this week it's possible 
that even though you're drawn to Jesus because of his love, mercy, and grace, it's possible that he's going to start whispering in your ear to call you out on some things. And I hope you listen then too. I hope that when he whispers in your ear and starts calling you out on your friend group or your weekend plans or your parenting, I hope you listen then. Because if you don't, if you choose your own opinion, your own idea about who Jesus is, maybe that's not God you're worshiping here, but maybe that's an idealized version of yourself. But the message of Jesus is stark and the message of Jesus is clear. He says, I have come here to shed light, to expose and transform this dark world in your dark heart. And I have done this not to hurt you, but to help you. Not to harm you, but to heal you. I have done this not to belittle you, but to build you up. I have done this. I have done this not to break you down, but to convict you of a better life. A life that looks and loves more and more like me. I have done this to convict you of my way my path. The light, it reveals the heart of God. It guides us along the path. It exposes and transforms the room of darkness. You can just imagine that dark closet when you flip on the light. Everything, everything is different. I want to I mention now the last one is that the, the most important, I think, time that the light is mentioned in the Bible is in the very, very first place where God just sets it up and says, there is an important, you need to know that there is a light in this dark world. And in Genesis 1, he opens that up and he says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the problem is that the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. As God sees the problem before the earth was formed and filled, he goes, listen, it's without structure and it's without filling. It's formless and it's empty or void. And so God speaks into that darkness. And at first he says, let there be light and darkness as a form, a structure. And then he says, oh, by the way, let's, let's, make, uh, let, let's make a sky and seas. A uh, third day, let's make land to walk around on. And now that it has some structure about it, let's go ahead and fill it with a sun, moon, and stars to govern the day and the night. Let's fill the sky with birds and the waters with with fish. Let's Let's create people and animals to inhabit the land that I had just made. Don't you see, God is saying, if the problem is, is, is formlessness and emptiness, God says, I will give it structure and I will give it filling. I will give it purpose. And it happened a long time ago, I understand that. But I think that it's already, it's also happening today. As many of you are heading into your week and going, listen, you don't understand. It is without structure. It is without form. It is empty. It is void. My life is meaningless. And God speaks into that dark place in verse 3. And he said, let there be light. And there was light. And maybe now you need to hear Jesus in a way that reveals the heart of God, in a way that guides you, maybe even in a way that exposes what's in the dark corridors of your heart, but definitely transforming. Jesus is speaking into your heart, and he's saying, let there be light. I will give you, I will give you meaning. I will give you purpose. I will give you hope. I will give you life, and life eternal. Because after all, in the words of Jesus himself, I, I am the light of the world. And wherever you are in this dark planet, you will be able to look up and see me, the light of the world. May you stand up. Let's pray together. Let's pray to the light that shines in the darkness. Jesus, as John tells us early in his gospel, you are the light that shines in the darkness. In the darkness of this world, though taking your life, it has not overcome, has not overcome you, the light. The darkness has not understood you. The darkness has not comprehended you. God, you spoke into the darkness and transformed it. God, we ask you to speak into the dark places in our weeks. 
God, when nobody's around but us, when we look at ourselves and have these moments of honesty in the mirror, God, as we start to start to wallow in our own in our own brokenness and our own sin, God, whisper, whisper into our ears and into our hearts and say, let there be light. And may we be the people that follow closely behind you to make it safely to our eternal destination. Lord Jesus, for your life, for your teaching, for your death, and for your resurrection, we say thank you. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen.